Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Pentecost Sunday, May 31st, 2020. I'm your lay reader, R Ruling Elder Zach Cosner. I'd like to have you turn your attention to the announcements that can be found on the back of the bulletin. The bulletin can be found on a link underneath this video on YouTube and on Facebook, or you can head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, and look for the um, publications link found at the top of the page. Now to the announcements. The deadlines for Junior High Jubilee offered by the Presbytery of Arkansas have extended their deadline for registration. The trip has a few openings left, and if you have an interested youth, please contact me via social media, or you can also contact the church via social media. Montreat has canceled their youth celebration for senior high students. As I said at the top, today is Pentecost Sunday. Please visit the link found in the bulletin uh, to make a gift to the Pentecost offering. By receiving the Pentecost offering, you are nurturing the faith of those who are uh, the church to come, children, youth, and young adults. And our uh, Minute for Mission uh, today will be focused on the Pentecost offering. The Presbytery of Arkansas invites everyone to join the Summer Presbytery Meeting this coming Saturday at 9 a.m. via a Zoom, the Zoom meeting platform as an observer. If you're interested, you can contact me via social media or uh, the church through social media. Um, I'll get you the online, um, the password and the uh, conference uh, ID. Only elected commissioners will be allowed to vote on measures before the presbytery, but you are invited to, uh, to view the meeting as a guest. Online archives of our services can be found on Facebook and YouTube. Links to each are also on our website. We also now have online giving available, which can be found on our website. At the top of the page, click the Donate Now link. Let us prepare to worship God. <clears throat> the God of heaven has made his home on earth. Christ dwells among us and is one with us. Highest in all creation, he lives among the least. He journeys with the rejected and welcomes the weary. Now come all who thirst, and drink the water of life. Come now, all who hunger, and be filled with good things. Come now, all who seek, and be warmed by the fire of love. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sins before God and one another, first using the, bulletin printed, uh, using the prayer printed in the bulletin, and then silently. Almighty God, you poured your Spirit upon gathered disciples, creating bold tongues, open ears, and new community of faith. We confess that we hold back the force of your Spirit among us. We do not listen for your word of grace, speak the good news of your love, or live as a people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Transform our timid lives by the power of your Spirit, and fill us with a flaming desire to be your faithful people, doing your will for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. And now silently... Amen. <clears throat> As people born of the water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And now for today's Minute for Mission. Take a minute to look back on your life. Who all have you lived with? In the earliest parts of our lives, we might live with parents or grandparents or other caring adults, perhaps siblings. Over the years, we might live with friends and extended family, family of choice, or even sometimes with strangers. And sometimes we might find ourselves living alone. No matter whom we live with now or whom we have lived with before, 
God's vision for the world is that everyone find a place within God's kingdom, in God's house. What we celebrate at Pentecost is God's pouring out of the Holy Spirit so that people of every identity and language can hear a word of welcome into God's household. All belong in God's household, and we get to live together and learn together and celebrate together. At Pentecost, we look especially to the children, youth, and young adults whom God has called us to live. The psalmist remind us, reminds us of the importance of faith being established during our earliest years, saying, God, from my youth, you have taught me, and I still pro proclaim your wondrous deeds. God's youngest family members need support to build their full potential in both faith and life. And all of us who have a role to play, these young ones also show and sometimes teach all of us more about faith in Jesus Christ and how the Holy Spirit is moving in our world. The Pentecost offering lets us support the development of children, youth, and young adults in our community and throughout the country. 40% of this offering stays within our community because we want to build the house of God together in this place. The remainder is sent on to our denomination so that young adults can lay a foundation for their lives through a year of service as part of the Young Adult Volunteer Program. It is also used to support ministries with youth through experiences of worship and formation like the Presbyterian Youth Triennium, which gathers nearly 5,000 young people every three years to learn and grow together. There is also a portion of this offering that supports the education of every child in this country through the Educate a Child, Transform the World National Initiative. Even when there are no children or young people in the places where we live, there are many, many with us in the household of God. During this Pentecost season, I want us to celebrate the fact that we are building a life of faith and building the household of God with our children, youth, and young adults. Through our gifts today, we join with them and with God in building that household together. And you know what we always say, if we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, breathe on us. Inspire us to give and to grow your household. Thank you for the special place you offer to the youngest members of your family. May our efforts reflect the joy and delight that Jesus showed in welcoming children. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the 20 or the 11th chapter of the book of Numbers, beginning with the 24th verse and proceeding through verse 30. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, and Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Our second reading comes from the second chapter of the book of Acts, beginning with the first verse and proceeding through verse 21. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as a fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. 
Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. One Pentecost Sunday, little Johnny's mother asked him what his Sunday school lesson had been about after church, and Johnny responded, don't be scared, you'll get your quilt. His mother asked if he had even paid attention in Sunday school. Oh yes, said Johnny, don't be scared, you'll get your quilt. That's what the teacher told us. Utterly confused by all of this, Johnny's mother called up his Sunday school teacher and asked what a quilt had to do with Pentecost, and she chuckled and said, I don't know. My lesson was be not afraid. Your comforter is coming. It would seem that something got lost in translation. I think the same could be said of Joshua's response to the gift of the Spirit that enabled Eldad and Medad to prophesy in the camp as if their doing so somehow threatened Moses's authority. Joshua failed to understand the magnitude of what was happening that day. God was setting 70 elders apart so that they might help bear the burden of the people of Israel alongside Moses. And far from feeling threatened, Moses embraced this and said to Joshua, would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. But by rushing to Moses' defense, Joshua was dangerously close to misinterpreting the grace of God. And he lost something in the translation. No matter where we look these days, things get lost in translation. We say, for instance, that we value hard work, but time and again, our elected leaders, not to mention our justice system, tends to look the other way when CEOs run their companies into the ground and receive outlandish bonuses while their employees' pensions are gutted. 
We say we are one nation under God, and yet we remain bitterly divided over any number of issues, not least among them is the role of faith in the public arena. The fact that so much gets lost in translation is one reason why I am so fond of the story of Pentecost. As Luke reports it in Acts, I think an appropriate summary of the events of that day was that people began to say, now you're speaking my language. Real communication took place on Pentecost. In fact, according to tradition, one of the great miracles of Pentecost was the miracles or, or the miracle of language. Now, this was not the miracle of ecstatic speech or speaking in tongues of which Paul wrote to the Christians in his first letter to the Corinthians, but rather the gift of speak or, or speech was the ability to bring bring the good news to a multitude of listeners from various backgrounds and who understood the disciples speaking and his or her own language. On Pentecost, our mind's eyes see tongues of fire and our mind's ears hear symphonies of languages pouring forth over throngs of people from different lands and cultures. And certainly Luke's emphasis on the various nationalities present that day adds to that interpretation. But one thing that has always struck me as I have studied this passage is how very similar this group of people gathered on that Pentecost would have been. Yes, we are told they are gathered from many different name, nations, but we must remember that these were all Jews or Jewish converts or proselytes because Pentecost was a Jewish festival long before it became a Christian celebration. It was celebrated originally 50 days after the Feast of Passover to mark the celebration of first fruits, the harvest of barley and winter wheat. But after the destruction of the temple, Pentecost came to celebrate the gift of the Torah to Israel. It was one of the Jewish high holy days in which devout Jews were required to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So then, though they had come from very many different places, those who had assembled in Jerusalem that day were either, as I said, Jews, converts to Judaism, or proselytes who had gathered for this festival. They may have come from different places, but they shared a common faith. And it is also possible that this gathering of faithful Jews didn't really speak that many foreign languages. Verse 8 of Acts 2 insists that those gathered heard the disciples speaking to them in their own native language. But the native language for the Jews who had been scattered throughout the Roman Empire was not the local dialect of that particular region where they lived, but rather it was typically either Greek or Aramaic. Jews in the western part of the empire would have spoken Greek, and Jews in the eastern part of the empire, where Israel was, would have spoken Aramaic. So in the view of at least one biblical scholar, in order for the disciples to turn and address this crowd in their native tongues, all they would have had to do was speak either Aramaic or Greek. And if that were the case, then what can we say was the real miracle of Pentecost? Well, let's return to the text. And there we find that Luke describes the arrival of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples while they were still in some safe and secretive room in a house, presumably the upper room in which Jesus had shared his last supper with his disciples. But once they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with power and authority, the scene suddenly shifted to a more public forum. 
And this new setting, identified as a gathering of devout Jews who had come together to celebrate Pentecost, must surely have been at the temple. And that is where the real miracle took place. The holiness of the temple site and the worship that took place there were emphasized not only by rituals, but by language as well. The language of worship in the temple had always been Hebrew and nothing else. It was known as the Lashon HaKodesh, the holy tongue. Within the temple grounds, outside where the various booths and whatnot would have been set up, people would have spoken in their vernacular of their regions, you would think. But even there, they had to speak in Hebrew. In spite of the fact that many foreign Jews didn't really know Hebrew all that well and found it incomprehensible. Think back to the days in the church when everything was done in Latin and those who had no education had no understanding of what was taking place in worship. So then if the temple was the setting for the first testimony of the Holy Spirit's power and presence on Pentecost, then it would have been a shocking sound where everyone was used to hearing Hebrew spoken to either hear Aramaic or Greek. The common language, the language of everyday people became the vehicle for the Holy Spirit's message on that Pentecost. So I think perhaps the real miracle of Pentecost was less about the number of languages spoken, but rather that people could hear and understand the message itself. The disciples were talking about God's wondrous deeds of power. Implied in their speech was the fact that we all need God's power to transform our shattered lives. So what they were talking about in short, was the language of human need and God's grace. As such, that was a language to which everyone present could respond, now you're speaking my language. It was a language in which nothing could get lost in translation because it was a language that described finding the heart's true home. As St. Augustine once remarked, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. They understood each other because they were all talking about the same things, the wondrous things of God. These were the basic things, the first and surest realities of all of life. Love and loyalty, need and failure, sin and salvation, hope and freedom, these things are common to all people regardless of race or nationality. And the ability to understand this common language of human need and God's grace was on full display that first Pentecost. As the Holy Spirit's power and presence shattered the forces that divided the people, we begin to witness the restoration, restoration of creation's harmonious unity. Christian community begins to take shape unbound by time or space, race or clan. People as seemingly different as night and day suddenly find common ground in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. United in the Holy Spirit, we see visions and dream dreams about that time when God's reign shall be fulfilled. How appropriate in this day, when we are a nation deeply divided by political views, by party allegiance, by the tension between the health and well-being of others and the desire to assemble in large groups, and as we have begun to witness with increasing hostility in recent days, whether or not to wear a mask when we are gathered in public. Again, the true miracle of Pentecost is God's ability and willingness to bring us all together. 
And as we find ourselves bound to Christ, to one another, and to Christians from every place and time, we also are reminded that we are bound to all of humanity in all of its joys and sorrows, hopes and fears, triumphs and tribulations. We are the body of Christ sent out into the world to speak the common language of human need and divine grace. We are the body of Christ sent out to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God. We are the body of Christ anointed, set apart, empowered by God to ease the burdens of others, to stand with the outcast, to empower the powerless, so that nothing about our witness will ever be lost in translation. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please join me, confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings, which can be made via mail to 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603, or through our website, www.centralprespb.com, at the no Donate Now link at the top of the webpage. <clears throat> it is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit, until that most glorious day when in the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend and every tongue shall confess him Lord to your honor and glory. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. At this time, let us share our joys and concerns, if there are any. Um, I do believe I have a few um, from our Facebook Messenger group. If you care to join our Facebook Messenger group and you're on Facebook, uh, please uh, like the Central Presbyterian Church um, Facebook page and uh, shoot that page a private message and we will get you joined in and you can uh, uh, enjoy the, the fun and merriment that we have uh, on that uh, messenger group. Um, we were asked to uh, say a prayer for uh, Dana Neal's father, who is uh, apparently in ill health. We've also continued, uh, we also continue to pray for Brad Von Tunglin, uh, who is also uh, having medical issues. Uh, we do have a, a joy to uh, share uh, Kyle Juckin's uh, family received a very, some very good news, um, and that's uh, we do uh, rejoice for the news that he had heard this week. Um, we also ask for your continued prayers uh, for the session of this church as we uh, continue to uh, try to decide uh, with the Lord's, um, the, with the Lord guiding us on whether or not we should uh, open up the sanctuary for in-person uh, worship services in the coming days. Uh, speaking of, of COVID-19, uh, we continue to ask for prayer for those on the front lines, our medical professionals, our law enforcement officers, um, our uh, correctional officers, our fire and police, 
um, those who are coming into contact with uh, people on a daily basis, uh, grocery store clerks, um, fast food workers, and um, those in the meat processing uh, industry. I know that uh, we heard this week that there was many uh, cases diagnosed in um, uh, Tyson uh, plants up in uh, northwest Arkansas in Washington County, uh, which is also uh, contributing to community spread in that area. Uh, we pray for a uh, quick resolution to this uh, pandemic uh, for healing and for um, comfort for those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. Um, I would also be remiss to not mention <clears throat> Uh, we would like to, to pray for those who are dealing with injustices in this country and in this world, um, those who are uh, dealing with um, violence and um, persecution. Um, we pray for uh, the Lord's intervention in those situations and, and comfort those who are grieving, which are many in this world. Uh, we pray that uh, that the Lord comforts them and, and, and leads peace to this land. Um, it has been a very tumultuous week, and uh, we, we pray that uh, the Lord is with all those who, who are suffering and grieving uh, these past few days. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. We ask that you continue to be with those who are fighting or who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. We uh, pray that you are with Brad Von Tunglin and with Dana Neal's father as those two gentlemen continue to face medical hardships. Uh, we, uh, we thank you for the joy uh, and, the, um, and the good news that the Judkins family heard this week. And we also ask for you to, to bring comfort and peace to our country to our world and comfort those who are grieving the loss of loved ones and and those who are who have who have been affected by the tragedies this past week give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of jesus christ who taught us to pray together saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace, to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit. Taking today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.